Hello, and welcome to another A Tippling Philosopher video with myself, Jonathan M. S. Pierce. Today I'm going to talk to you about slavery and the Bible and Christianity. And I'm also going to bring into play a topic of my previous interview with Emerson Green on the meagre moral fruits argument. So the meagre moral fruits argument is to say, look, if theism were true, we would expect to see that theists, or you could say if a particular type of theism, like Southern Baptist Christianity were true, you'd expect to see Southern Baptist Christians being more morally decent agents than people who were not in that religion or sect um, or who were not theists. So, you know, if theism were true, you'd expect theists to be morally better agents than atheists. If, if, if Southern Baptism were true, you'd expect Southern Baptists to be better moral agents than all other people in the world, um, and even more so than atheists. Uh, and the idea is that, you know, as moral frameworks, you know, religions supposedly have some kind of transformative power. Uh, and therefore, you know, being a part of that religion is to be part of a better moral framework and you expect. So this is like an inference to the best explanation argument, an abductive argument that state, states that, you know, on balance, what would we, looking at the data, would we, does the data best support atheism or theism, right? Or Southern Baptist Christianity against not Southern Baptist Christianity. So you, you look at the data and say, right, are, how, what does morality look like descriptively? So we look around the world and say, okay, atheists and theists don't look particularly different, or indeed atheists and non-religious people have better moral characters in this and that um, area. And, you know, it, this is evidence against theism being the most probable explanation of data. So on and so forth. And, and we talked uh, about it at length, and, and I suggest you go and check that video out. So now I'm, I'm going to be reading this book going forward. So this is by the late, great uh, Hector Avalos, who is a, uh, was a biblical scholar. He's, he's recently just passed away, sadly. Um, and his, his most recent book was Slavery, Abolitionism and the Ethics of Biblical Scholarship. I just want to read a little bit to you on this. I'm going to hopefully do a series on slavery. Um, because, you know, one of my friends and, and followers sent me this book in order that I do do a bit of analysis on this channel. So thank you very much to, to, to them for that. And um, I think the whole subject aligns really well to the meagre moral fruits argument. You know, what would you expect given theism, right? If slavery is bad, you would expect more theists to uh, be against slavery over history than, than non, the non-religious, than atheists. But what do we find? Now, part of the problem here, and what, what I'm going to talk about just in, in this part, is, is a great deal of the problem in terms of Christians in general, but scholars as well, is they are presuppositi presuppositionalist. That means that they presuppose certain things. You get this whole idea of presuppositionalism in biblical, um, in, in theology, which is, you know, the idea that the people presuppose the truth of the Bible. And you just start with that as your axiom and everything goes on from there. Well, actually, every Christian does this to an extent, right? And what they do, and this is what um, Hector Avalos says in his introduction, he says, and this is page, I don't know, page one, um, my project actually began with a puzzling experience. If one reads almost any book on Christian ethics written by academic biblical scholars, one finds something extremely peculiar. Jesus never does anything wrong. This is a really interesting point that we sometimes forget or sometimes don't realise, sorry, is the approach Christians have, whether at the top of biblical studies or lay people. The, the, the just axiomatic assumption well an axiom is a self-evident truth and i don't think this is a self-evident truth this is just an assumption so it's not really an axiom 
but it works as an axiom at the bottom of the of, of the whole you know pyramid or framework of belief system that Jesus never does anything wrong. Jesus is just perfect and by extension God is perfect. We're going to start with that fact and take everything on from there. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, but of course, this then completely colours how you interpret historically and exegetically the whole Bible. Gospels of the New Testament and the epistles and then the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. If you're going to start with, OK, God exists. God is perfect. God is all good. Jesus is God. God, God can't do anything wrong. Jesus can't do anything wrong. Then you go and start properly analysing the Gospels. You are only going to go in, in one in one direction. You, you are you are constraining yourself to only one set of conclusions about what you do. That's a real problem. I think, it, you know, it, it just it really um, represents one of the big issues within biblical studies, but also within Christianity at large. And actually Hector Avalos's previous book, I think I lent it to someone, I don't have it anymore. The End of Biblical Studies is, is really very good in, 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 you know, looking at the problems within biblical studies in terms of issues like this. He goes on on page two to say, so it looks as if scholars with open religious commitments and scholars with seemingly secular commitments. So he's just quoted um, a biblical scholar, a religious biblical scholar, Christian, and a secular scholar commenting about, Jesus and uh, saying that, that you know it can agree that Jesus never did anything wrong this uniformly benign picture of Jesus's ethics is peculiar because when historians historians study Alexander the Great or Augustus Caesar they note the good and the bad aspects of their actions even when academic biblical scholars study Moses or David they might note their flaws from a purely historical viewpoint, Jesus is a man and not a God. He should have flaws. So how is it that most academic biblical scholars never see anything that Jesus does as wrong or evil? The answer, of course, is that most biblical scholars, whether in secular academia or in seminaries, still see Jesus as divine and not as a human being with faults. Such scholars are still studying Jesus through the confessional lenses of Nicaea or Chalcedon, rather than through a historical approach we would use with other human beings. In fact, Luke Timothy Johnson, a well-known New Testament scholar at Emory University, remarks, quote, We can go further and state that the basic historical claims of the Nicene Creed were well, are well supported. He was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. In essence, what the most universally used Christian creed asserts about the human person Jesus is historically verifiable. Okay, we, we can argue with that. Although Johnson realises that many of the supernatural claims about Jesus cannot be validated historically, he adds that, quote, the only real validation for the claim that Jesus, sorry, that Christ is what the creed claims him to be, that is, light from light, true God from true God, is to be found in the quality of life demonstrated by those who make his confession. Johnson, of course, assumes that this quality of life, based on imitating Jesus, must be completely good. So there's a kind of circularity going on here. And just read two more paragraphs. But if Jesus is a special case, one would not know it from books treating the wider scope of biblical ethics. In general, there are few, if any, books by biblical scholars that denounce biblical ethics. Some may denounce specific actions God is portrayed as commanding or allowing, but few denounce a biblical God in general. This is admitted by R. Norman Wybray, a noted biblical scholar who quotes, The dark side of God is a subject that has received astonishingly little attention from Old Testament scholars. The standard Old Testament theologies, monographs about the Old Testament doctrine of God, articles about particular passages, even commentaries are almost silent on the matter. Even those that make reference to them have tended to play down such passages 
or sought to explain them away with a variety of arguments, which is really significant because he's a you know a gen genuinely committed Christian biblical scholar who is saying actually when we look at proper academic treatments of the Old Testament in particular there seems to be a lack of attention to the atrocities contained within. Now, some modern secular writers, you know, your Hitchens and your Dawkins and, and a lot of other people doing work on, you know, analysing the Bible will be far more critical. But in, in the circles of biblical studies, and particularly at the time when sort of wide are writing, uh, which, you know, that's, I, I think that, that was, when was that? That might have been in 2000, that book. So, uh, you know, there's this admission that, you know, there seems to be some whitewashing of, of the problematic, morally problematic and ethically problematic uh, events and writing in the Bible, Old Testament in particular. And uh, when, when we then look at how slavery develops over time and the fact that slavery was count countenanced in the Bible and then countenanced by using the Bible. It was justified by the curse of Ham. You know, you, there's so many religious um, Christian slave owners in, in the antebellum South in, in North America were God-fearing Christians. What does this best support? Does this best support the thesis that, that theism is correct, Christianity in particular is correct, or that atheism is correct? The idea that God would create some revelation that he knew Christians would misinterpret and use to countenance and justify slavery is really problematic. So therefore, that data that many, many Christians um, supported slavery, were involved in slavery um, and, and the slave trade does that best support, and, and, and that God knew that would be the case, does that best support Christian truth or atheism as truth? And I'll, I'll, I'll sort of finish here with what Avalos says on page four. Despite the thoroughly benign manner in which biblical ethics are often represented, the Bible endorses horrific ideas and practices. One of those horrific practices is slavery. One of the most tragic and vicious institutions ever devised by humanity. For about 1,900 of the last 2,000 years of Christian history, it was self-described Christians who kept slavery, in some form or another, a viable institution. Yet many modern historians and biblical scholars still claim that the Bible was a main factor in abolition. And, and I think, and it obviously goes on to say that, you know, this is a real problem. That on the one hand, Christianity is used to countenance slavery. And then on the other hand, pro-Christian scholars will say, well, it was a major force in the abolition. Uh, and and he's, he's going to look very closely at that. But forgetting the abolition part of it, that's, that's like saying, you know, oh, how, how great that this person uh, saved... Uh, Jimmy from um, from drowning. Well done, Harry. You saved Jimmy from drowning. Turns out that Harry pushed Jimmy into the river in the first place. So it's really bizarre to congratulate Harry for saving Jimmy from drowning when Harry was the one responsible for throwing him in the water in the first place and making him start drowning. In the same way that it's rather odd to say, well done, Christianity, for being really heavily responsible in abolition. Uh, when Christianity was hit really heavily responsible in why slavery took hold in the first place or not inhibiting it in any way. Um, so I think, you know, it's going to be a really interesting book and I, and I look forward to doing a, a, a series on it. And I, I just wanted to point out at the, at the moment two things. The, the presuppositional element of a, lo a lot of believers as it's just like Jesus is, is good, everything Jesus does is good. God is good, everything God does is is good. Uh, and then analysing the Bible. That's a real problem. Uh, and I wanted to look, uh, just mention how closely this aligns, the whole slavery argument or analysis, 
uh, aligns with the meagre moral arguments. Uh, m sorry, meagre moral fruits argument, th whereby, you know, what does the data of moral behaviour best support? Theism or atheism or a particular type of theism against all other people outside of that group. So I and I think this 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 is yet again more evidence to support um, the meagre moral fruits argument. Anyway, hope that is of interest to you. Um, please grab my new book, uh, 30 Arguments Against the Existence of God, Heaven, Hell, Satan and Divine Design. That's out. Uh, really um, appreciate anyone who supports that. And if you're in the UK at the moment, obviously if you're watching this video in a year's time, this ain't going to be the case. But uh, this is on offer on Amazon. There are obviously other great bookstores, better bookstores you can buy it from. But if you are an Amazon um, consumer, that in paperback is on offer why I am atheist and not a theist. Please grab that book as well. That will, that will detail my entire worldview and how I constructed that from bottom up. Uh, and this details why God can't exist, certainly in the form of classical theism, where God is omni, omni, omni. That God doesn't exist. Anyway, that's a bit of spam. Question everything, particularly yourselves. Take care. And until next time, doodle pips.